I'm super happy to be here today, um, and I'd like you to join me in just a quick moment of prayer. Oh, Creator, thank you for bringing us together here today to celebrate, to learn, to share, and to relationship build and to connect. And one small thing. Tonight, can I have some sleep? I've been awake for two nights now in preparation for this day, so I'd appreciate just a little bit of sleep. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That's great. The other part of this is we'll do a little physical activity. So in our world, we honor spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. So I'd like you to get up. You can stay sitting in your chair if you can't get up. And I've borrowed a little part of another indigenous culture in the world from India in kundalini yoga. I'd like to raise your hands in the air and start waggling them in kundalini yoga. If you waggle like this for one to two minutes every day, you waken up your nervous system and you calm your nerves. So this is all about me. <laughs> Thank you so much. You can have a seat. And the other thing that I have with me today is my talking stick. So this gives me the power of speech for the next, say, 20, 25 minutes. Whoop. Disclosure. That's me. Um, I don't have anything to disclose. Um, I'm pretty inexpensive. And I have nothing to disclose here either. So these are our learning objectives. Um, we hope to strengthen knowledge on our health benefits program, um, to learn how pharmacists and pharmacy techs, as one of the first points of contact for health care, can improve the provision of safe services for First Nations clients, and to advance the understanding of the concepts of cultural safety and humility. So this is us today. Um, we have 26 cultural groups, 34 languages, and two, over 200 bands, actually, communities in, in BC. Uh, three provincial First Nations organizations, there they're listed there. And if you want to know more about the, uh, we're having a huge revitalization program here in BC around our languages. And there's, uh, for more information on that, you can go to that website there. But this is where we are today. Most of our, our communities are, are remote and on the lower mainland. There's a huge concentration of them there on the island. Um, but many of our First Nations communities are actually in remote areas where access to anything is pretty much nigh to impossible, including proper uh, health care, uh, food, nourishment. Um, so it's pretty difficult for some of our communities. So our common vision. Um, when we created FNHA, there was a huge long process of evolution to actually getting to where we are today. So our vision is to have healthy, self-determining, and vibrant First Nations children, families, and communities. Our values are based on these things, and the predominantly the big ones for me are relationships and respect. But the inclusion of discipline, discipline in our lives, in our practice, in our health, in our wellness, our culture is so important, and excellence and fairness. These are our directives. We have seven of them. Um, Community-driven, nation-based is extremely important. We want our health and well-being to be driven by our communities. We want to increase First Nations decision-making um, in our health and wellness. So we want people to actually participate in, as a wellness partner in and having a better life in this world today. Of course, improving services is really important. FNHA really wants to uh, improve the services that we deliver and improve the services that Health Canada used to deliver. Fostering meaningful collaboration and partnerships, developing human and economic capacity, and being without prejudice to First Nations interests. We also want to function at a high operational standard. In First Nations world, we, we a lot of circles going on. So a lot of circles we have. This is our model for wellness. In the inner circle is the human being. Around that inner, inner human being is uh, the four spirit, emotional, mental, and physical. Around that next circle is the land, our nations, our communities, our family. 
And then in the outer circle is social, economic, cultural, and environmental. And on the very outside is all the people and the children. This circle that we have here provides the lens through which FNHA works through everything that it does. It's developed from ancestral law and teachings that we have had for thousands of years. At FNHA, every one of us is a health and wellness champion. We're a wellness partner, and we live it in everything that we do. We have a high commitment to supporting the health and wellness from the youngest to the oldest. And our commitment is to the generations to come, seven generations behind us, and seven generations in the future. Our health and wellness journey belongs to each of us and is as unique as we are. So when we look at wellness with our, our clients or our partners, it's meeting them where they are in that moment of their health and well-being. It's, it's so that they can come forward into their wellness. We also want to be on the leading edge of systemic change so that we're moving away from health and disease process into the wellness base. So it's moving quite differently, I think. We use a lot of art in, in our work. Um, every presentation that we deliver that is fairly on a large scale is we have a graphic artist, Sam Brad, or one of his um, people come in and they do graphic recording. So this is a picture of uh, our ecosystem of health and wellness. It starts with me. The other part of that, it stops with me. So it stops with me and it starts with me. Ecosystem, we're moving away from a model which we've had for hundreds of years probably, which has been very egocentric. Now we're moving into a very ecocentric. So that means that we're looking to the um, environment. Uh, we're, we're re, let's see, reconnecting with the planet. Uh, we're recreating our relationship with Mother Earth. And so that's the way that we have to move into the future. And the other thing that I'm finding is that we're being pulled into the future. We're not pushing into the future anymore. We're being pulled into the future that is to come. So our program is no longer non-insured health benefits. So that means that non-insured health benefits was old health Canada language. We now have our pharmacy benefits uh, providing eligible clients with coverage for over 8,500 specific, specified drugs and items, including prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and medical supplies such as diabetic test strips. So our clients and our costs, you can see um, our costs are huge, enormous in First Nations. Um, it's probably the highest cost for us and our communities. Um, it's astronomical, and it's only going to be going up. And we were speaking about chronic disease earlier. Um, chronic disease for our people is massive, complex, very, very complex. So that we have diabetes is predominant, cardiac disease, and many others. Um, it didn't used to be, but it is today. Challenges and priorities. Um, we want to transform our, our health benefits into a wellness program. Uh, we want to engage pharmacists and technicians as partners in care so that we can address prescription and non-prescription drug misuse as part of that. Um, polypharmacy is another huge issue, and it was mentioned earlier, people uh, can be on anywhere upwards from 10 to 20 medications uh, in a day, which is uh, quite obscene, actually. So we want to try and reduce that down, and we can do it through medication reviews, uh, med rec, we can do it through all sorts of different ways, but you guys play a key in that whole, that whole challenge. So first, a, a question. Where did you learn the history of BC? Just shout it out. In school? In high school? Where else? Sorry? Yeah? Sam Sullivan? <laughs> Did you learn about First Nations history in school? A little bit? Did you get told the whole thing? Nope. So this is really interesting for me. So maybe it's a little good time to share a bit about my story. So about three years before, about ago, um, I started to get pulled really strongly to First Nations. 
I've had a love of indigenous cultures all my life, but three years ago I really started to get pulled. And I don't know if you have experienced this same thing as when a change in life is coming, you feel the pull. And sometimes we go into major crisis before that choice actually occurs. So that happened to me. I started to be pulled to First Nations. So what happened for me was I started to do a lot of investigation. And emails started coming in, or I'd bump into certain people. And they would say, share with me, you need to do some indigenous competency training. And I said, well, where do I go to get that? And they said, well, you need to go to PHSA. So I registered at PHSA. And I did the online course, and I was blown away. I was blown away because I, got, I did not get taught a huge part of our Canadian history. And I felt robbed of that. And so I spent now the last two years um, trying to make amends for that from my, from my place of being. Um, so I did the training. I've taken more court courses in First Nations history and culture, ancestral law, I've buddied myself up with some great people in First Nations Health uh, that are elders, and I've been learning so much about our history. There is a great book. It's a hard read, I want you to know. But a gentleman called Tom Swank, he wrote, The True Story of Canada's War of Extermination on the Pacific, plus the Chilcotin and other First Nations resistance. Um, it, it's an amazing book. And what this guy has done is, over 10 years, he has uh, investigated and researched the history of BC around First Nations. And it is really hard to read. There are mass graves here in BC. There were intentional use of smallpox to eradicate First Nations people so that they could get the land. It was all very intentional and very sad. But it's a great read, and it's a very important part of our history and our culture. Do you know, I've mentioned PHSA safety training, but do you know where to learn more about First Nations and cultural safety? Do you know where you can go? Chris does. If you go on, uh, it used to be called uh, the Indigenous Cultural Competency Course. It is now called Sanyas Training. If you go in and type in Sanyas Training in your Google search, you can actually get on, online modules that you can take around this. They're really good, they're very high level, but they take you some places which can be a little hard to take. But it's well worth taking the training. And if you get an opportunity to take a college or a university course on First Nations history and culture, it's well worth it. And there are several um, universities that are indigenous uh, here, actually, in, in Western Canada. Just going to check my Fitbit for time. It's not checking for steps. Um, so our opportunity. Pharmacists and pharmacy techs are one of the first points of contact. We know that. Um, you are a key touch point for us out in community and, and in, in the cities where we all live. Um, you know the data around yourselves. It's six, this blew my way. It's 6,647 pharmacists, 1,890 pharmacy techs today and 1,357 pharmacies in the province. Like, that's massive. I had no idea. Um, 7,000, over 7,000 paid claim lines per day and an estimated 2,900 client interactions per day. That's outstanding, astounding to me. Pharmacists and pharmacy techs can improve the provision of safe services to First Nations clients. When I do a lot of talking uh, uh, in teaching, I talk about the power of influence. And we all know that we can influence each other. We influence each other every day by what we wear, what we say, the tone of our voice, how we wear our hair, what we do with our hair. We put it up in little ponytails, and somebody really likes it, and you're influencing a whole other, whole other wave surge of, of um, changing culture. So using your influence strategically is where the power lies. So when you think of the power of influence, which adds 35% to the 15% of control that we have in our everyday lives. That's massive. That means we have 50% influencing power. We need to use it intentionally. We need to use it strategically so that we're actually influencing culture around us in a really positive way. So think about that, is how you speak, what you say, how you act, how you behave influences everything in and around you. And it's a ripple effect out into the world. What is cultural humility? 
This is a slide that Joe likes to use a lot. Um, I believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. And when I read those words, I think of when words come in through my head, I have a lens. I have this hearing lens with which the words filter through. And sometimes that cultural lens, that my perspective, it, it filters things out. So what you actually say to me is not what you meant. So that's what that slide means. And when you take it into cultural humility, we're looking at being culturally humble to people around us. And this isn't just about our world anymore. This is about everybody's world. But this is a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique to understand personal, my own biases, and to develop and maintain mutually respective partnerships based on mutual trust. So this is what cultural humility is all about. Being culturally humble provides a safety net for everybody in this world to nest. This is the declaration. Joe Gallagher has been working very, very hard in his life to recreate a world of cultural safety and humility. In July of 2015, he worked with the Ministry of Health and each CEO in this province in every health authority to have the Declaration of Cultural Safety and Humility signed. This is our guiding work. This is what's guiding us now today. And um, so this is that uh, we're striving for cultural competency in everything we do. Cultural humility is the only way that we can get there. And with an open heart and open mind, we can increase the space for cultural safety. So I think one thing that I certainly know in my healthcare profession, it's gotten a very technological based. So it's kind of like we're robocops running around in a very technological world. That, it's that way for a particular reason. Um, but having said that, we can bring our spirit and our heart into the work that we do. Sometimes we leave it at home for lots of different reasons. But bringing it with us every day and being mindful of cultural safety and humility is really important. So Joe talks a lot about hardwiring cultural safety and cultural humility into health services in BC. As part of our province's quality and safety agenda, we're on a mission. It's not going to stop. So jump on the bandwagon with us. Um, and these are the people that are involved. We really want to get uh, our health partners, pharmacists, college of physicians and surgeons, um, the nurses, LPNs, we need to get everybody on board for this. And we need to get training into those high school pro programs, junior high school programs, university courses, college courses. It needs to be everywhere. So we're on a campaign. We're starting on a campaign for cultural safety and humility. This was the kickoff of it um, on June 21st, which is National Aboriginal Day. Um, we kicked off with a website and we asked everybody to pledge something around cultural safety and humility, role modeling cultural safety and humility, whatever it is that you choose to do as an individual, as a group, or as an organization. This is a tweet sent out by Minister of Health, our Terry Lake. And our opportunity as pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, we can improve the provision of safe services to First Nations clients by learning about the impact of colonization, residential schools, systemic racism, discrimination, stereotypes, health inequities, and the social determinants of health for First Nations people. Sanyas Indigenous Cultural Safety Training, so ICS, is the great place to start. And I've mentioned that already. It's an eight-hour online course. Um, and it's through PHSA, I've already mentioned. And this is the data. So since April of 2009, um, Cheryl Ward was instrumental in the creation of Sanyas, and she was working with this since 2008. But since 2009, this is the numbers of uh, health professionals in BC who's actually taken the training. So it's quite marvelous. Um, to date, under 2%, so about 123 pharmacy staff have taken the ICS training. So I invite you to please think about uh, getting the training under your belt and being a part of BC's Cultural Safety and Humility Campaign. This is really important for us. So First Nations communities and the members of those communities don't have a lot of trust for the healthcare system. 
Hence, it further impacts their health and their wellness. So if we can make it a safe, trusting environment for people to actually come and access health services, we'll be way better off. So I invite you to join us with that. This is our campaign. It's hashtag cultural humility and hashtag starts with me. Um, we have a resource booklet that our communications department put out on June 21st. It gives you some ideas. Um, we are adding to our campaign by um, creating a webinar series, which uh, will be announced on Monday. We're in partnership with the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. We have 14 months of uh, lunch and learns um, to come starting on October the 4th. And you can register for those. They're free. Uh, they're noontime. They're going to be all different topics around cultural safety and humility and First Nations education and culture. So uh, that, that will be super fun. So we're really excited about that. And we're currently putting together a, 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 what we call a change package or a booklet for change. It's really um, an artistic driver diagram. So our goal is to have the healthiest uh, services for First Nations communities in BC. And it'll be a package which gives you all sorts of change ideas, things that you can do around cultural safety and humility. Simple things like self-reflection exercises. I've talked about already on one of the slides. Um, there's all sorts of different things in there from policy right down to individual things to do. Uh, on the website that there was there, you can print the card, make a commitment. You can take a selfie or have someone else take a picture for you. Um, hashtag it to a starts with me and attach that photo and send it in. Our communications department pick up on it. Um, we had 100 commitments in the month of July, which was our target. We actually got over 100. We'd like to get over 800 in this next year, so till next June 21st. So how many of you guys are in this room and how many of you guys are online? 500 maybe? I think so. 500 would take us a long way in getting to that 800 pledge commitment goal. So again, I'm going to plug on that and invite you to get it, get your selfie in there. Hash it starts with me. That's all I have for today. Uh, Hashka, uh, thank you so much. <laughs>